This is an interview of Mr. Joseph John Burton, born March 9th, 1919. The date today is June 17th, 2004. The interviewer is Robert Gardner. Mr. Burton, can you tell me what war and branch of service you were in, served in? Uh, I served in World War II. I was in the Navy and I was in the Supply Corps of the Navy. Were you drafted or did you enlist? I was one of a group of people that the services uh, offered uh, what was called a probationary commission upon uh, graduating from college. That meant that you could not worry about the draft and subject to some unusual event, uh, you would get a commission at the time you completed training, uh, subsequent training in the service. And I, I did that. I uh, got, I was a com commissioned an in, an ensign in the supply corps when I graduated, a probationary one. And I subsequently ended up at Harvard University Business School where the Navy had its Supply Corps School and got my permanent commission. Where were you living at the time? Uh, I was living, I had, I, my home was Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, and I'm just counting that from when I uh, graduated from college. I went to work after I graduated because the commission didn't go into effect immediately. And I worked in New York City for about a year until I was called up to go to the business school at Harvard, uh, which was in June of 41. Uh, we we uh, stayed in the, the school was not in session at the time. We were there and uh, it, compri it was comprised mostly of learning all the techniques and technical matter about supply core handling. I had one interesting classmate who was John Roosevelt, the son of the President of the United States at the very time that we were in school together. He was a very, very affable, nice young man. And I remember well that we had only one telephone on each floor in the hall. And when John would go out when Daddy would call, for some strange reason, there was a sort of an appeal and and wonderment in saying that he, to me at least, and I think other guys, because the doors would be cracked all of a sudden. Uh, at, at, at thinking this 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 guy's talking to one of the most powerful people in the history of the world, and I'm standing here in this hall over here. <laughs> As minor as that might, might be, that was one of my memories of, of Harvard. Uh, the rest of it was learning how to march and all the other things that I didn't have much interest in. Do you recall your first days in the service? I guess they were the first ones in that way. Uh, the first regular assignment I had was in Portsmouth, Virginia at the Navy Yard and, uh, and I was just, uh, as the Navy term for it goes, I was a makey learn. <clears throat> I'm sure that expression came from the China Station in the Navy, but a young guy that didn't know anything was referred to as a makey learn and I was that uh, in, the, in, the, in the Portsmouth Navy Yard. The, the main event and importance in my life of that first little service was that I met uh, my wife to be in in Norfolk while I was stationed in the Portsmouth Navy Yard. Met her at a party that uh, was, of course, the most important day of my life. <laughs> Did you actually go to boot camp training? Nothing except the Harvard experience uh, drilling on the playground or the football field. And learning, learning all of the things that you needed to know about procedures and 
how to get go aboard a ship and all of the things that you would impress, which I guess is a boot camp type thing. But uh, one of the essential differences is I was already an officer by having gotten that probationary commission, and and you didn't have the same experience that boot camp guys do with a tough sergeant. So that was a blessing. <laughs> Which war did you actually serve in, sir? World War II. At the time, it was a, it was sort of an assumed thing by people my age coming out of school. By the way, that that we were going in the service. There was no question about it. Of course, we had the universal draft, but there wasn't there wasn't any. Uh, it, just, it was just taken for granted if there ever was one about a matter that important. Although the, the uh, companies that recruited employees from colleges consistently sent people down there despite uh, all the possibility, I guess they may have need, needed it even better if they get hold of somebody that wasn't going in the service, but they recruited just as much as, uh, as uh, they would in normal. Where exactly did you go, sir? In in uh, from the from uh, the Nor Norfolk Navy Yard. Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> there was a a captain that was running the Navy Yard. Uh, that was a old time Navy guy. He came up through the ranks. He didn't he didn't go to Annapolis, but uh, and I was very fond of him, and he. He uh, asked me if I would be interested in joining him. He had been ordered to go to Scotland on a very secret mission, which was turned out to be to train, uh, to run the camp, the place where they, they would train uh, troops who were going in with the British on the invasion of North Africa. And he was to be the supply man for the whole operation which lasted approximately three or four months, I guess, maybe six months. So I was delighted to uh, to accept that and, and go with him because I liked him a lot. And so I, when I left Norfolk, uh, we flew to uh, that uh, we flew over to England and stayed there for a week or two. The, the order was actually to join Lord Mountbatten's staff. His, his staff was running this training thing in Scotland. And we stayed in London probably a week. I saw the great man one time in a massive meeting where I sat pretty far in the back. But uh, from there we went to a place called Roseneath Castle, Gerlach. If you know anything about the geography of Scotland, there are massive lakes or inlets from the, from the ocean all up through the uh, western end of Scotland. And it's just this, the conditions are just like being at sea, so it was a perfect place for that kind of work, to, that travel to take. And we, we took, uh, after we stayed in London, we went and established this camp. And pretty soon the big ships would come in there and they, they, under, the, under the army, there was a lieutenant, I mean a general in charge of the army part of it, as well as an admiral in charge of the, of the navy part of the whole program. And it, was, it was in us. I was there for six months, I guess. From there, we thought we were through, that we'd done all the ships and the day was coming when the, we had been told when the invasion was coming. Of course, it hadn't been generally circulated. Those who had to know something about packing up. About a week or two before we left, the British informed us that they didn't have anybody to run the port of Oran, Algeria which was one of the places that we were going to take. And so they wanted the Americans who were running the camp there in Scotland. Wouldn't we love to go with them on their nice ships? 
down for, for the invasion of North Africa. Needless to say, this was a caused a sudden change in in our plans. Excuse me, uh, Ken. The story after leaving Scotland with the British on a British ship, I want to. I neglected to tell a detail or two uh, about the trip from LaGuardia to Shannon Island by commercial airline. And at that time, Northern Ireland was a neutral country and had commercial service from uh, New York and other places into Ireland. Uh, but you could not land there in uniform lest you be imprisoned for the rest of the war. And so to prepare the people who were going over there for the flight, there was a sort of a two or three hour school in which you were shown how to pack your suitcase so that it didn't show any military buttons or other giveaway paraphernalia when it was opened by an inspector in Ireland. We were told that the inspectors were very aware of what was going on, but they didn't, you could, we didn't want to embarrass them, and there was a possibility that the Germans at the time had uh, one of their consul out just accidentally to be there when the plane came in, uh, and uh, just to let the Americans know that they knew what was happening. And so it was, it, it was, it was uh, adamant that the thing be done that way. As a consequence, when we when the plane took off, there was a plane load of people all in mufti, no uniforms on the plane, and you didn't know who you were sitting by. I was a raw rank ensign in the United States Supply Corps, and I learned later that I was sitting next to a full general in the Army. I knew he was some very important somebody, but he uh, he, he looked like an awful pretentious uh, <laughs> corporate executive. I, I, was, I knew he was a very senior fellow. Also on there, <laughs> we had an interesting incident. There was a, uh, a courier from the White House to, to Churchill. That's what we were told. This went from Roosevelt to Churchill, this very young guy had a bag of mail chained to his arm so that it would never be misplaced and no one was to touch it, which was fine, except he found when he started to go to the men's room, he couldn't get the bag in the men's room with him. And he did not have the key to the thing. So by some ingenuity, he worked out a way to hold his hand and the bag out in the, in the aisle and close the door sufficiently. But it was, uh, it was a, a humorous situation for, for a while. Uh, getting back to the, to the uh, North African adventure, we were told, as I previously said, uh, that on short notice that we were going to um, go with the British and run the port of Oran after we got there. What had happened that provoked the invasion, I think, is worth noting. Uh, Montgomery had become the new commander of the 8th Army in the desert against Rommel. It, the, they weren't doing very well, and when Montgomery got hold of it, they uh, he, he, they got a lot more troops, they got a lot more active, and they, uh, they crushed the Africa Corps uh, not too long after Montgomery had taken over. And Rommel was pushed back then, and he didn't stop falling back until he got to Tunisia. The Allies, the British and Americans, plan was to land guys that left him in the middle between Montgomery and the new landing, which would be North Africa. Uh, uh,
stop them. You I forgot to do the most. Of Another important part of the uh, maintenance of of secrecy of keeping you from revealing your military connections that we had to uh, take care of in going on a on a civilian airplane into Ireland was that we were issued passports provided by the Navy of course that did not that the photographs of which we were in civilian clothes and the description on the app, on the passport was government employee, as you will see uh, from uh, right here. It reads government employee. Here is my photograph in civilian clothes. Looking at it, it seems that I've aged considerably since that photograph was taken. But you, you can never guess that I was a naval officer from it. It has always been a wonder to me that our government would go to that sort of deception. I don't know why it's so uh, curious, but it always has been to me. I'm glad they did. As I took my, my passport out, to be examined. The inspector, being an Irishman, had an exaggerated sense of humor, and I'm sure saw an extremely nervous young man approaching, and I was one of the last in the whole line going through the, through the inspection, if not the last. And he took my bag and opened it and he ruffled through it, and I, I was just uh, so obviously nervous. I think he overdid that. Just, and finally he decided he closed it up, looked me straight in the eye, and said, "Army or Navy?" Immediately I had visions of the rest of the war in an Irish prison, and I utterly did not know what to say and I almost came unglued and finally I said I just have to take a shot at it to myself. I said Navy and he closed the thing and just broke down laughing. I think I may have been one of his funniest victims but I've always remembered that as a good example of the <clears throat> Irish sense of humor even in very serious uh, events. Uh, Back to North Af to North Africa, we landed on uh, the uh, staff landed on was scheduled to land on D plus one. Uh, the first wave went in on D day, and we were the next day in. Uh, the, that part of North Africa was under the control of the Vichy French at that time, and it was, it was not certain whether that would be how much opposition there would be when we landed. And it was modest. It, uh, the French, I think there was one American cruiser that was, was uh, damaged a bit. But I don't think they sunk anything. I, when we went in the next day, we saw no, no visible evidence of a whole lot of naval damage. And we went in and uh, went straight to a dock and tied up, which was probably one of the great peaceful <laughs> invasions in history. But <clears throat> my, one of my first and most important tasks assigned me was to go see the head of the French Navy to tell him that we were setting up a supply situation in Oran, and we w w wanted their help in where to get supplies and where to, how to begin operation, and I had some particular lists of things that were urgently needed. Uh, and I gave that, uh, 
I, I, I was provided with an interpreter. And I gave that message to this stern fellow that I went in to see. And he looked me very steadily in the eye for a while, and then he reached down and pulled open a drawer of his desk and pulled out a a probably foot long piece of shrapnel and held it up and in I don't know what his words were said that he didn't have any intention of helping the Americans. The shrapnel ties uh, is tied to another pre-invasion instance in which the British Navy had sh the the Vichy French had most of the French fleet in Merzel Kabir, right near where we went in, tied up. And the British Navy told the French to get them out because they afraid the Germans would get them. The Vichy French refused to remove them. And the British said, if you don't remove them, we're going to sink them. And they didn't remove them, and they shot up the French Navy, who foolishly had left them tied up in, at all. And this shrapnel was a piece from the assault on Marzell Kabir. So uh, <clears throat> I reported that back, and actually, after a reasonably short time, the Vichy French saw fit to be cooperative because they saw the size of the endeavor when we unloaded the Third Army to get down to come in uh, with Montgomery and trap Rommel. And they came in and they uh, had modest fighting, I think, for a while. But uh, the surrender finally occurred in Tunis, uh, I think about uh, less than a year later. I'm not sure when that date was. But uh, I, at the time, had uh, been sent by my superior down to Tunis when they were foreseeing this uh, surrender because there were thousands of German soldiers out there who were going to surrender. And there needed to be some provision made. Not that I could do that, but they needed all the help they could get in handling the how the traffic and how the loading of these guys on ships. We loaded them on ships in Tunis for prison to send them that they've taken all taken prisons. And I have never uh, seen more of a scene of mayhem in my life of just total disorganization than when I got into uh, Tunis and got into the middle of the traffic area. It was uh, stuck cars and they couldn't get couldn't uh, make any progress at all. And it looked like a hopeless situation to me. Less than 12 hours later, eight hours later, overnight, I get The Germans, being the orderly people that I always have known they are, extremely organized, extremely orderly, and extremely, I think, realistic, simply went and got their MPs, their military police, their traffic people, <clears throat> and put some of their own people all over the roads in Tunis, one at every corner. And it's the odd thing that the corner would have a, an American MP and a German MP standing together, directing whatever cars was coming, they could speak to them. So the thing cleaned up in practically no time at all. As, and uh, and I, I'm sure that, that there, were, there were other examples of that some of the Germans actually came to Oran, where I was stationed originally before I ran down. I, I just went to Tunis to help with that situation. Um, and we had the port near where our offices were, just full of German prisoners there. And for a day or two, they were behind the fence. We'd go out and talk to them. Some of them could speak very good English. And they generally, to begin with, were very good-looking, naughty-type big guys and, uh, and very 
good looking soldiers if that if I had ever seen any. And so I made a trade among other things with one for he had a bracelet. This may not show up at all, but anyway, he had it on. He had it on his uh, wrist with his ID information on it. And he wanted cigarettes so bad, he told me that, uh, showed me the bracelet and said, you ought to have this for your ID. I had an ugly thing hanging around my neck. And uh, I said, what do you mean? He said, well, uh, if you could find me a carton of cigarettes, I'll swap you. So that's what we did. I got this for a carton of cigarettes and I got it redone. And I had one of the all time great IDs here for the rest of the war. I'll take a break. I could. Too long thereafter, I was uh, relieved of uh, duty to return to the United States and to report to the Navy Department for my next assignment. Uh, my first duty when I arrived back in Norfolk, Virginia, uh, which by the way I reached by uh, ship from Casablanca over through one of the worst storms at sea I've ever had anything to do with and barely, barely uh, made it back it seemed to me with there was a whole bunch of people on there that were very desperate to see sea. That's just an aside. Anyway, I called my wife-to-be and told her with complete confidence that having been uh, as long as I had uh, on foreign soil, that when I went to Washington I would be able to choose virtually anywhere in, where there was a Navy supply course situation in the United States because there's the rotation in the Navy it's called seashore, foreign shore. You go from sea to the shore back to the United States, to foreign duty and back to the United States. Stateside duty is, alternates with either being at sea or being on foreign land. And I had been on foreign land for two duties. And uh, I said, we can, we can uh, get married and go wherever we want to go. But I, first I'll run up to Washington and find out just where it is uh, we can go. So we had some thoughts about it and I, I think she was somewhat cautious about my certainty as it proved to be correctly. So I walked in the Navy uh, office to announce to them what I wanted to do and the guy said, what are you going to do? is go to Astoria, Oregon and help commission the USS Sitco Bay, a baby carrier, uh, which will be commissioned as soon as it's completed. It's in the shipyards at Astoria. And then you will proceed as the supply officer on board that ship to the South Pacific, which somehow did not seem like an ideal situation. Uh, to report back to my wife to be, but I did so, and what we planned to do was I would go out and look the situation over and see how long we had before I went to sea and what seemed like a sensible thing to do. And uh, having done that, I called up my, I called her virtually every day in a very public place where these ladies were working and I could use the phone right up on the desk. And they couldn't wait each day to hear me uh, propose again. <laughs> Since it was an event they looked forward to, but anyway I, I did that and uh, we finally decided on a day that I had enough time I saw in commissioning the ship and I could get a couple of weeks late leave. <clears throat> so having done that, we decided on a date to get married and I went back to Norfolk and we had a fantastic wedding and a trip by train from Norfolk to Chicago 
in Chicago to Astoria, Oregon, which was somewhat arduous because it was full of troops and a few wives. The ladies were not permitted to eat uh, all the meals that the troops were. I guess it was because of shortness of, uh, of food or whatever. But it, it didn't appeal particularly to a new bride, the whole process. Uh, but anyway, it was successful in that sense. And we got in the Astoria and got settled in a very nice place. And, uh, worked there on the uh, commissioning of the ship. Uh, Well, I was, we were married, I was married uh, in, in February of 1944, and the ship, uh, I, I went to sea on the USS Cisco Bay on what I think was about June of 44. I haven't got the exact uh, date in mind right now. Uh, I stayed on that until uh, uh, till, actually till the Japs surrendered, which was not all that long. It was closer to the end of the war than uh, most of us realized, but I made innumerable trips uh, back and forth from either San Francisco or San Diego to Pearl Harbor to uh, the Manus Islands, the uh, Philippines, all over. And our mission was to carry uh, aircraft and the crews, the flyers that flew them, uh, taking a load on it uh, in the United States or at Pearl Harbor and going back to the fleet and replenishing all the planes that they had lost in any air battles uh, so that they were constantly in good shape. Uh, I've got some pictures here of the ship. This is was be when we were sailing uh, out to go to the level of the planes. Usually, uh, the, the flight deck would be much more uh, filled with aircraft. This has got all the uh, the uh, flight deck completely covered, as well as the hangar deck just as tight as so that we got uh, geometrically arranged things. They use little uh, toy planes to get the arrangement to get the most planes we could get on each trip. I, I would call your attention to one other thing in, in this photo and that is that all of these planes are propeller planes. and. Uh, the jet plane had not become generally used in, uh, in battle, at least at that time. So the launching of them by a hydraulic sling, catapult it was called, uh, was extremely touchy uh, because it only had the propeller power to be thrown off of the ship and still catch before before it uh, fell into the sea. I was <clears throat> privileged to be on one that did that one time while I was on the ship and I can tell you it was not uh, the most pleasant thing I'd ever, I ever did. Uh, <clears throat> we took a load of uh, of uh, ships, I mean of uh, airplanes, and you had to have parachutes when you took that uh, airplane. You had to have a parachute for everyone. 
we left the States and got on the way to the Admiralty's Islands with a load. And uh, one of my people in the supply department <clears throat> started unloading the chutes out of that carton when we discovered that they were the wrong kind of shoes. They have a chest pack or a seat pack. And in the planes we had, let's say, were chest pack planes, and we had enough seat packs for one for each plane that were totally useless. And we, the cartons that we had were marked wrong. The captain called me up on the bridge and was somewhat upset, as you can imagine, and he said, I'm got a little job for you to do, and he told me about the situation. Well, I think I, he had been told, but he said, uh, I'm going to send you over to the island as a big, uh, a big Air, Air Force, uh, English or some other country, I can't remember who it was, now, uh, facility over there, and I know that they'll have these the proper shoots to go with these uh, seats to go with these airplanes. Uh, he said, I think if you make judicious use of some of this beef that we've just loaded at San Diego, that you might come back here with enough uh, seat packs to take care of the situation. I said, how am I going to get over that? He said, I'm going to put you in a plane with a with the air officer, the, the head man on the on the ship, and fly you over there. So uh, I saluted and said, aye, aye, sir, with not the greatest enthusiasm. And it is, it is a trip to do it. Uh, first you must sit upright in the plane when you're going to be catapulted and you reach your right arm across to the, over your body and take hold of the other side to help hold you in besides having your seat belt on because it's a tremendous force put on you. When we launched, I, I thought we were going in for sure and it looks that way because I've seen it done before but the plane just does everything but land on the sea. It, it drops precipitously, and then the motors are going at full blast. It catches finally and lifts you up. And then they, he took me over to the. I remember they were Australians, the Aussies. And sure enough, the beef worked wonders. Uh, and when our ship came on in and un to unload uh, part of the ships, part of the planes, we got the plane back, I believe, part of it and took it to another part of the load. Um, I need a break. I have to look at my notes. Among several other instances that are, uh, are worth noting about uh, on my duty on the Sitco Bay in the South Pacific, Among, among them, one of the more entertaining, which many, uh, most people in the Navy are aware of, uh, is uh, the introduction and, and uh, to any, by any uh, person on the ship who has not been across the equator. When you go across for the first time, you must be initiated into the Eptuna, Neptuna Regis Society, which uh, in, involves an initiation process that is almost unheard of and as to uh, what it happens to you. Here is a certificate which is awarded you after you survive. I, will, uh, I think you might be interested in 
hearing to whom this certificate is addressed. To all sailors, wherever ye may be, and to all mermaids, whales, sea serpents, porpoises, sharks, dolphins, eels, skates, suckers, crab, lobsters, and all other living things of the sea, greetings. On this day, the ninth day of September 1944, in latitude and longitude 153.52 east, there appeared within our royal domain the USS Sitco Bay bound south for the equator and for a secret U.S. naval mission. Disobey this, uh, be it further understood, that by virtue of the power invested in me, I do hereby command all my subjects to show due honor and respect wherever he may be. Dis disobey this order under penalty of our royal displeasure. Signed, David Jones, His Majesty's scribe, for Neptunus Rex, ruler of the raging main. As you can see, this is an extremely serious matter with uh, the United States Navy. And I have here some snapshots that give you some idea of the mayhem that ruled aboard ship during that time. Yet another unforgettable incident was uh, being on board ship at sea during a monsoon. And uh, I, most people have heard of the terrible power monsoons and that they tend to occur in that part of the world in the South Pacific and around the Philippines, I think, and uh, Australia probably. We got word that the lice of monsoon was coming when we were tied up in the Admiralty Islands at Manus, and there was an immediate emergent order for all ships to leave the harbor because of the power of these things and the danger they would endanger to the ship itself. So the process was to go out in clear water a sizable distance from the port and head into the sea, into the direction of the wind coming towards you. This is where the ship is most easily controlled and can handle those high winds uh, uh, the best. If it's turned to the side, it would roll the ship over and likewise behind you would be dangerous. The, uh, the ship was empty. We had no planes on it. And the process with aircraft carriers <clears throat> was to let all elevators from the main deck down to the bottom, to the hangar deck, so that it put as much weight as possible in the bottom of the ship. Now all of this is an emergent thing, and it, it, it was a terrifying experience when we were told to do all this because, frankly, it, it, uh, there were those aboard who said this thing could turn over. We were in the CVEs, escort carriers, which were uh, built originally as a, as a uh, not as an aircraft carrier at all, but as a transport ship, and they just put a hangar deck on it, so it was top heavy anyway. But we went out and, by the grace of God, uh, endured it. And, and to give you an idea of the of the uh, force and violence of that monsoon. 
one ship in the squadron we were in, captain reported on his report of the event, that he could stand, or, or the crew or anyone could stand on the, on the hangar deck with the elevator down as it was and look straight up through the elevator and see blue water. Now, there's not much way to interpret that except that the ship was lying almost on her side. And I know that our ship uh, had somewhat the same reaction. I don't think anybody did reported it, but that was an official report. So I, I, I got to enjoy the violence of the South Pacific, which I had not been prepared to do. <laughs> Finally, the ship on the, uh, while I was on it was engaged in what has been described uh, as the greatest single naval battle that is, is remembered as the biggest naval battle ever fought anywhere. And it, la it, it la I've forgotten how many days it lasted, but it was uh, an enormous battle. And I was, my ship was fortunately among those that, uh, that did not get in the violence of the battle itself. Three or four, I cannot remember which, CVE 86's sister ships of ours were sunk in that battle. Uh, here is a map of the of the, the lady area. And the, the famed Surangaya Strait is right here where the Japanese fleet came through unexpectedly. <clears throat> we, there were two, two groups of, uh, ship, of Navy ships there and the Japanese fleet had been uh, diminished somewhat and had devised a plan whereby he would draw one of our groups under the under the control of, of Admiral Halsey off to the north, as you can uh, see from the map, and thereby leave the uh, the uh, that part of the Lady area un unprotected or less protected uh, in. Uh, it was all based on MacArthur's famous return, and th these ships were gathered down there to cover his return. return. Halsey, the Jap Japanese uh, admiral, uh, had some ships go north to make Halsey think that the whole fleet of Japanese were north, further away than they were. And the, sh the group of ships that I was in was under Halsey, and he took the bay, and we all went north. Another group, another fleet, uh, not another group, under Admiral Spruance, uh, that had most of our ships, uh, our baby carriers in it. And we had been in it and were transferred to Halsey, fortunately for us. Uh, and that was a group that had the ship shot up bad. But they did so well against the Japanese, much to the surprise. The Japanese trick worked, but the ones, uh, the, the rest of our group on the Spruance actually tore up the Japanese fleet, which had come through that small strait with planes off of the baby carriers. And uh, they thus succeeded in, in one of the, the, the real important, if not the most important, battle of the whole South Pacific campaign. And not that long, not long thereafter, the Japanese surrender occurred uh, with, the, with the Truman's dropping of the, 
of the bomb in Hiroshima. And, and they surrendered in August of 1945. Uh, I left the service uh, the following fall to end my career. Do you remember the day your service ended and where you were? No, I do not. Remember where you were on VJ day? I, well, that wasn't not yet for you, probably recording. Uh, I, 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 when I left the ship at first, I uh, was sent to teach at the Harvard Business School, Navy, where I'd originally started off my career at the beginning of this narration. Uh, before I got there, the orders were changed because the war was being closer to an end than previously expected, and I was sent to the Naval Air Station in Jacksonville. And I got there just in time to see or hear about VJ Day. And from there, uh, I left the service in that fall. I'm not positive of the exact date. The, uh, the, sur the surrender was in August, and uh, I think we, I got out about uh, October. Did you work or go back to school after you left the service? I worked. Did you make any close friendships while in the service, sir? Yes, I made several. Uh, uh, people that were on a ship, but most of them were from the West Coast, the, the, somehow the people on the ship were more from that part, and I never, never had much occasion to uh, develop that friendship, uh, except for join one uh, officer. One officer on the ship was a gunnery officer, George Moore, and he actually came east, and we had a long visit in Atlanta, Georgia. He was from Lodi, California. But I didn't uh, make any of uh, Frankie Albert, the well-known uh, uh, Stanford first T formation quarterback and later pro player and pro coach, uh, was a shipmate of mine on Sitco Bay. Uh, and I made a great friend of him, but I never saw him much. We had Christmas card exchange correspondence with a number of them. And one, uh, one chief petty officer came by my house in Atlanta, which was very touching to me. And uh, I enjoyed seeing him I, some years after I had left the ship. He, we had uh, exchanges and that, that, you, that you could keep track of people with. Other than that, I didn't make any permanent. Did you join any kind of a veterans organization? No, I did not. Do you attend any reunions, sir? No. We did didn't you? have any you mean ships. I didn't have any. What did you go on to do as a career after the war? I went in, eventually, uh, I went into the uh, grocery business at first with a grocery chain and uh, became the general advertising manager for the chain of stores and then opened my own advertising agency in Atlanta, which I maintained uh, for uh, eight or ten years and then sold. And I've been retired. Uh, I've consulted for four or five years and then I'm now in retirement. How did your service and experiences affect your life, sir? It was a very memorable thing, and I'm very proud of it, and I'm very uh, glad that I was able to do it. I don't think war is a, is a wonderful thing as such, but uh, it, it, it helped. It was a, responsible for my meeting my wife, as I said at the beginning of this narration. And I think I learned a lot about, uh, about humanity and and it was a very important thing to me. Is there anything you'd like to add that we have not covered in this interview? Uh, I don't. I don't really believe there is. I, I, I think uh, that pretty much sums up what I. I feel very good about my service. Uh, 
I'm glad to have this opportunity to to uh, tell a little bit about the actual things that happen to people in the service. And uh, I think that's, I'm thankful for the opportunity. I'd like to thank you for sharing your experiences with you. It's definitely been my pleasure, and I really appreciate you taking the time to come here and do this interview for us. Thank, thank you. you sir.